today on LA Currents. The City of Los Angeles has a brand new department that will focus on engaging young Angelinos. We sit down with the woman that will lead this new venture, Lisa Salazar. Next, with over 40 years of public service, it's hard to imagine there's anything that could surprise Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Yet the current state of politics is unlike anything she's ever seen. I sit down with the iconic Democrat to discuss her passion for the South LA district she calls home. But to start, Kristen Crowley has now been sworn in as the 19th fire chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department. It's historic for many reasons. She's the first female, first LGBTQ, and first paramedic to hold the office. She joined us on the precipice of taking office to discuss her journey to this point in history. Well, it's history in the making. The first woman fire marshal of the LA Fire Department is about to become the first woman chief of the LA Fire Department. I'm delighted to welcome back to LA Currents, LA Fire Chief nominee, Christine Crowley. So good to have you back. So wonderful to be here, thank you. You building roads quickly. You are really, I mean, it's six months is not a long period of time to go from one very important position to another. I tell you, my feelings were really mixed. I was very excited. I was uh, not shocked, but timing of it. I wasn't quite sure when and if this would ever happen. So when the mayor approached me and we had a, a number of conversations and then eventually when he made that decision to make me the nominee, you know, took a deep breath and said, okay, you know, let's do this. What are some of the things that are immediately going to be sitting on your desk. First and foremost, our members and firefighters and sworn civilian individuals need to understand that I'm gonna be bringing everybody along with me in this journey. It's not just gonna be me saying, hey, we need to do this, because I don't have all the answers. But I think the important piece is that, first and foremost, the community knows that we're ready and able to serve them. So the staffing issue is really going to be one of my number one priorities to make sure that the LAFD remains ready to respond to any 911 call. Los Angeles is a dynamic, ever-changing environment. How are you doing in appropriately serving communities that may have not felt that they were being served appropriately before? Right, so what's pretty amazing about our ability with our 106 fire stations that are spread throughout the entire city is there's the type of system that we have built on the fire side and the EMS side, there's no different type of treatment. If you live on one side of the city versus another side of the city, the truck, the fire engine, the ambulance, all the different apparatus, they're spread strategically so that we can provide that level of care to whomever needs it within the city. So that's, we actually, have that ability to do that and have had the ability to, to do that. So now it's creating that path of, okay, with our current resources, what can we look at to evolve so that now we're meeting the level of care that's required uh, for when you call 911. So that's the good news is within our 106 fire stations with all of our trucks, engines and paramedic rescues and EMT ambulances and specialized apparatus that it's spread equally throughout the city. But there are going to be areas that have more calls than other areas. Mm -hmm, there are, yeah, and we've already adjusted to that. So we're utilizing and leveraging data. We've done that over the past few years where the workload, right? So you, if you look in like the downtown area where you have a high density of number of people, of course the likelihood of needing service is higher than somewhere where there's a lot less dense area. So we would add an additional engine, we'd add additional paramedic rescues to help alleviate that work load for the firefighters and firefighter paramedics. But also, so now we have a backup to the backup. So if an ambulance is on a call and it's such a busy area, we have another ambulance, ambulance that is already assigned to that area that could go out to that additional call. So we've already built that into our system and that's working really well. But we'll continue to look at our numbers because in 2020, our numbers of, of number of, of incidents went up a tremendous amount. I think it was like something like 14% with the same amount of, of personnel, right? So then again, that's for me to tell that story. It's like, hey, how do we justify the need to ask for more apparatus, ask for more uh, trained personnel uh, to justify how do we balance the workload and the need of the community? There's two pieces to your job. There's the internal facing and then there's the external facing. 
what's the messaging there that there's an opportunity for every walk of life every type of person every opportunity is here at the LAFD and, and what are you saying to get those people in the door that might be our next firefighter sure so uh, the timing's perfect right because I'll be stepping into this seat with a kind of a new message a new vision but we're actually just opening up our, our hiring process so people who are interested may not have even thought they wanted to become firefighters my suggestion is hey check it out come to one of our training sessions you might really enjoy what we do as firefighters if you've never been exposed to it like I was never exposed till after college you never know right so I think the message is make sure that you keep your doors open and try try it out because the timing is a it's a small window we have a two-year plan where we open the hiring gates and then all of a sudden they're closed for two years so the window of opportunity we're making sure we get the message out there that the opportunity is there we're looking for qualified people who come in and, and who will be service oriented that are physically fit mentally fit and ready to do the job and serve the community so the window of opportunity is here and now so we're going to be pushing that message out to make sure that the community both local and across the nation understands that hey the, the opportunity is there for you okay so there may not be an answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways, because, you know, you are in a position in which you're on a higher floor. You're sitting there at a desk and you have people that report to you. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the issues of, say, sexual harassment or some of the problems that have come to light in the news with the department, mm -hmm. how can you actually address them? First and foremost is recognizing that there's an issue and, and having a plan forward for that. So obviously the ongoing education. Education is a key for any behavior in the work environment. So that education piece will be ongoing. We've done that to a certain degree, but I want to really take it to the next level. And I also think that the accountability piece is the essential back half of that equation where it's going to be clearly articulated that if a member does choose to step out of line and treat somebody inappropriately in the workplace, there will be ramifications if a member chooses to mistreat another member on our department. What are some of the exciting things that the fire department, or not so exciting, right. or unorthodox, mm -hmm. or unexpected, does? Now, with the pandemic, the fire department, we took a huge role in testing and vaccinations. Well, now we're kind of coming out of that. So now we're pivoting back, and now we're focusing on, okay, what's our primary mission? How are we going to better serve the community? So when somebody calls 911, whatever it may be, for a fire, 85% of what we do is medical. Right, so what are the innovative ways that now we can start to look at evolving kind of the new service model of how we can better serve the community. There's an opportunity for every walk of life, every type of person, every opportunity is here at the LAFD and what are you saying to get those people in the door that might be our next firefighter? Part of the recruitment strategy and I think just for me being in the seat and being visible, that's a lot of people go, I didn't even know that there was a female fire chief out there, whatever the case may be, but the messaging is very strategic. We go out in all different communities. We plant the seeds very, very, very early from our youth fire academies to our cadet programs, to our crew three, to any and any way that we can actively go out and show the community that, hey, this is there for you. We have a number of prep programs where we can prep people so they understand how to be successful in the hiring process, what we're looking for our candidates, and also the hands-on approach. You get to tell the story to everybody now. I mean, you get to tell the story not only to those that could finance whatever needs the department has, you get to tell the story not only to your constituency within the department, but you've been telling this story to lots of people like me. Yes. <laughs> so how is that going? I mean, the attention must be pretty profound. It, it has been. It's been a bit of a whirlwind the last couple of weeks, but, I, you know, I, I, I offer it open arms because I know how important it is to get the message out. Uh, I know really how significant this is, being the first female fire chief nominee for the city of LA. So, you know, I, I'm up for it. And I think the messaging is really, really important that I can get out there and tell the stories of what our department does day in and day out. Uh, we've got true heroes that show up every single day uh, and just work their hearts out to serve the community. All right, being fire chief is an incredibly important thing, but is that the end for you? Is there any other carrot dangling in front of you that we have got to schedule you for six months from now? <laughs> no, there's no, this is my, this is my primary focus at this very moment. Um, just want to step in 
and just have a clear vision and communicate really well with our people. Um, be there to support them and listen and understand what our needs are and uh, just put my head down and work. So there's nothing, there's no agenda on that back end. It's just literally, okay, how do I support uh, what our mission is, how do I support our people and how do I support LA? Well, sincerely, truly, and absolutely from the entire team here, congratulations, well-deserved. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate All it. All right, take care. Services for LA's youth were previously spread across 26 departments. Starting this year, they'll be centralized in the new Youth Development Department, helmed by Lisa Salazar. I sat down with Lisa to discuss her aspirations for the department and their first major project, the Olivia Mitchell Youth Council. Today I'm delighted to be joined by the director of the Youth Development Department, Lisa Salazar. So nice to have you here. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for the opportunity. It's very, very exciting. This whole brand new department specifically designed for Angelinos, you know, basically 16 to 24. So how is this particular department set up? First of all, we are uh, a lean and mean team of, <laughs> of eight individuals, dedicated uh, civil servants. Uh, who, when I interviewed them, the first question I asked was, why do you want to work for this department? Mm -hmm. And uh, their answers uh, had to have passion for the vision of the department and to just truly help young people uh, be successful with both their education and, and career goals. So obviously, the fact that the city council voted unanimously to create this department demonstrates there's a need. So, you know, what were the needs that necessitated making this come to life in such a coherent way? Well, I would say one is that the city of Los Angeles was one of the only large cities in the country that did not have uh, a department that was solely focused on young people. Two is a very strong grassroots advocacy of young leaders who strongly advocated for a dedicated department. Who are the people that you'll be working with? Who are you drawing from in terms of services? Exactly? Yeah, so, um, you know, as we approach the summer months, um, the city does a, a great job of creating um, summer youth employment opportunities. So we'll be working with the Economic and Workforce Development Department and they, uh, they run the Higher LA's Youth Campaign, so really any young person who's interested in um, a summer job uh, can connect there. We're working with our Department of Recreation and Parks. Uh, they have tons of just different programs available all summer for young people if they want to do uh, sports they want to do uh, cultural arts, if they, if they want tutoring, if they want to utilize a computer lab. Our library system is another example, our Department of Cultural Affairs. There are 26 departments in the city that provide services to young people. I know that there was an immediacy to this based on the pandemic, that you know, there was sort of an observed, you know, phenomenon that was happening that was, you know, very detrimental to our young Angelinos. How did that play in and what, what did what did everybody see that they needed to you know, do something pretty quick? Well, like you said, the, the pandemic had a devastating impact on our young people and their families. Um, the level of trauma um, from you know, a very personal level and, and, and the loss of life and, and dealing with grief to the loss of economic stability and for a lot of folks, even housing. Um, that really created a greater sense of urgency for the mayor and the city council and particularly our champion, Councilwoman Rodriguez, to make the department a reality now. There's never been a, a more important time to have a department like ours. And you know, this past seven months and starting up the department, I spent a lot of time just talking directly with young people, um, almost 500 at this point. And they're asking, they're asking for educational support, they're asking for mental health support, and they're asking for jobs. So I hope that you know, the Youth Development Department will be able to better uh, make those resources and services more accessible to the young people that need them the most. In addition to these services that are being provided by the Youth Development Department, there is a renewal of a program in its in a new incarnation of course that is very very exciting you know the youth council mm. so
the youth council is under the you know under the youth development department but the youth council is a chance for young angelinos to literally participate in government yeah yeah how does this work so the department um and i you know and, and i'm and i'm a part of it and that is you know being um an individual in in a, as an administrator in my former role designing programs for young people um without really talking to young people as much as i should have so the youth council um and and it's named after olivia mitchell yeah who is a legend here in los angeles and one of my mentors um, who actually uh, started the first uh, youth council to be situated in City Hall under Mayor Tom Bradley, um, and has and has graduated many many leaders such as you know Councilwoman Rodriguez and Councilman Corrett and, and former Councilman Tom LaBanche. This youth council will provide uh, an advisory group to our department and to the city. They will work hand in hand with us to assess the services of our city departments, um, go deep on the policy issues that are of interest to them. And I'll tell you from the applications that have come in so far, the policy areas that have risen to the top are education, mental health, um, uh, social justice and equity, and uh, employment. So um, they will work with us, they will advise us, and, and, and they'll be our ears and eyes on the ground and within their own communities to tell us what is working, what is not working, what's missing, what do we need to do more of, what do we do need to do less of. And they will help guide us in policy making um, and budget decisions around what services we should be investing in here in the city. So what are some of the details of this council? I know it's two council, uh, persons per district yep um, but what are you looking for what's the age yeah. range what is the interest level does it matter if they're in college or not you know no. what are some of the what are some of the deeds yeah so so we want this youth council to truly represent the young people of Los Angeles uh, so we'll have two representatives from each of the 15 council districts between the ages of 16 and 25 they have to be current residents of the city of LA they can be high school students, they can be college students. They could be part of that population that has disengaged. So they don't is, have to be a student. Well, we will work with them to get them they back into to school, okay. but if they're currently disengaged, you know, we're not turning them away either. And the reason I say that is because we wanna make sure that the council represents all walks of life of young Angelinos. So I know we're gonna have our students who are participating on student councils but I also want the students who have lived experience with food insecurity, housing you know, instability or possibly homelessness, young people who have had connection to the, the juvenile justice system, young people in foster care. I want to make sure that those 30 truly represent all Angelinos. What's their commitment? It's a 12-month commitment. Okay. Um, at a minimum, uh, we're going to ask them to come to two meetings a month, okay. 12 months. Um, we value their time and we respect them as experts, as young people and their perspective. So we will also be compensating them for their time. So I want to make sure that young people don't have to make that hard decision be between uh, their part-time job that they have to have to help support their family and participating in this great opportunity uh, to be a part of city government and decision making. So, uh, so we are also compensating them for that. All right. So, if somebody wants to find out about you know the youth council and getting involved, what's the easiest way for them to find out? Youthcouncil.lacity.org. So, if you visit us there, you'll have you'll have all the information. Uh, that a parent or a young person might need to understand uh, a little bit more about the Youth Council. Well, it was delightful to talk with you and I can't wait to hear about the future of the Youth Development Department. I'd love to come back and thank you for the opportunity. Some might recall her famous use of reclaiming my time when she felt her questions were being stonewalled. In memes, she's called Auntie Maxine. She's equally vilified and lauded in the press. 
Everyone has strong feelings about Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Well, she doesn't let the noise stop her from being a tenacious fighter for Los Angeles. She has served in Congress for over three decades. I am delighted to be joined today by Congresswoman Maxine Waters. It is such a thrill to have you in studio. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Fifteen terms in yes. Congress. I mean, just the changes, the drama, the, yes. the camaraderie and the yes. fights, all of that. Right now, what is going right and what is going wrong? I have seen the work of uh, the, a Democratic administration, a Republican uh, administration, and now we're in a very different time. And I'm not proud to, you know, have to share this, and I do share it uh, in the community. I've never seen anything like what we're experiencing now. Uh, we have people who have been elected to office who are part of groups like QAnon, uh, the Proud Bars, the Oath Keepers, and the KKK. They're in the House of Representatives and the Senate. These are people who I think are undermining our democracy. In 2018, you were selected to be the first woman to chair the House of Representatives yes. Financial Services. That is a huge yes. position, incredibly yes. important. And, and how has that affected you and who you are as a congresswoman? Well, first of all, let me say that you're absolutely right. It is a huge responsibility uh, to be the chair of the Financial Services Committee of the House of Representatives because we're dealing with all of Wall Street, uh, we're dealing with all of the capital markets, we're dealing with housing and all of HUD, mm -hmm. we're dealing with uh, the World Fund, we're dealing with all of these entities and you have to pay attention to all of them. So this is a big job. and. I focus on housing, and I'm fighting now to make sure that that $150 billion is in that Build Back Better program. You've never shied away from a fight. <laughs> you know, you have been very outspoken a number of times, and sometimes that's been called back on you. Does that bother you? Are you okay with that? Are you fine with needing to say what you need to say? Do you ever have any regrets that maybe something that you've said been pulled out of context and had been used in a way that it shouldn't have been? Or are you glad that the attention is being paid because you're being heard? Well, I am pleased that for whatever reasons, you know, how I was reared, um, my religious uh, background with my family, I'm pleased that I'm able to feel confident to be able to speak out when it appears to be dangerous to do so. Because as politicians, you're always thinking about whether or not you're going to harm your own ability to be reelected, et cetera. And so I'm free of that, and I feel good about that. Of course, there are times when I regret that I could have things, done things differently. Maybe how I could have avoided a confrontation. Maybe how I could get more people involved. And I think about that a lot, and I try and use my experience to do better. There have been such world-altering issues that the government has had to face. Politics aside, a pandemic, um, civil unrest, so many things that have been volatile. Is anything moving forward? Are you feeling a bit discouraged or are you feeling as if there's going to be a radical shift and things are going to get better? I mean, where are you in terms of tone? Well, um, there certainly is division. Um, in a way that keeps us from being able to advance the kind of legislation that we feel is in the best interest of the people. We're fighting right now on something called Build Back Better. And Build Back Better is a kind of continuation of the CARES program and the American Rescue Program. When this president came into office, he had to work very hard and very quickly to make sure that we had the masks that are needed uh, during this pandemic, to make sure that we had the testing sites uh, because we had very few, and to make sure that vaccination was available to all uh, that we would want to try and help get vaccinated in order to deal with the pandemic. And so we did a lot of work. We got some support in the CARES Act. And then following that, uh, because of the leadership of the former president, 
uh, who basically had not embraced the idea of wearing masks and people getting vaccinated, that there were people who were discouraged and what we call uh, vaccination hesitancy. We had people in the black community who did not want uh, to get vaccinated because they referred to some experimentation that had been done some years ago. We've overcome a lot of that with a lot of hard work. I have to take the vaccine. I have serious, serious underlying health issues. If I don't take the vaccine, I won't be here, I'll die. I know I'm safe. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna live now. Now, uh, we're finding that the division is hardening. For example, there is a group working with some of the members of the House of Representatives who have organized just to organize against vaccinations and masks. And they've turned it into a political effort and they have rallies, et cetera. But we're fighting. We're fighting with Build Back Better uh, because we know uh, that we've got to continue to support the families in this country and the children. Many of our um, residents lost their jobs, businesses closed down. Many of our mothers had to stay home because the schools were not open and they had to learn to do distance learning. Um, we had to help with the unemployment. We subsidized unemployment, put a little bit more money in that. We really did a lot for these small businesses. We had the PPP program uh, that helped to provide the loans and grants that were needed to keep them open and keep them operating. And of course, PPE. It was so important for our nurses to have everything that they needed, the gloves and the gowns and the shoes and all of that. But we have to continue because one of the things that we know is we're susceptible to variants. And even as we have fought this last variant, Omicron, we have a new variant that's coming on. I think it's referred to as B2. Right. And it may be very contagious. Along those lines, though, with the crisis and the drama feeling slightly as if it's behind this, the, the economic aftermath of all of these programs is sort of being felt as well. So how do you get the messaging out that this is a period of transition and not a period of complete downturn in the economy? Because I know that that's, once the drama's passed, how do you explain to that yes, interest rates will go up because we need to rebalance. Yes, there will be some costs that are elevated in order to help pay back. How do you get the messaging out so that it's not a ricochet in the other direction? Well, it's very hard. Yes. Uh, because when people go to the grocery store, the, price the of prices things are, yes. have very much increased. You know, I always use bacon as an example. It is one dollar above the normal price of bacon. Right. And so this is throughout, you know, our grocery stores. Gasoline, up over $6 in California, and I think the median in the country is 4.5 or something like that. And so, first of all, you gotta recognize uh, that it's difficult for people and their families and people on fixed incomes. Before you try to explain, oh, uh, you know, it's gonna get better and what is happening, recognize that people are confronted uh, with these kind of difficult and help difficulties and help out in every way that you can to point them toward resources that may be available to help in their particular situation. We must work as hard as we can to get this economy back uh, in a way that people can have a decent quality of life uh, with the earnings that they have. Well, Congresswoman Waters, yes. you are incredibly inspirational in terms of your independence, your veracity, and your commitment to the people that you serve. It has been an honor to have you sitting here with us, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate getting to know you more, and I cannot say how much I wish you all the best. So thank you for everything. Thank you so much. You know we could do this for a couple of hours. We should. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll do it again then. Thank you. I enjoyed being here with you. Thank you. And that's a wrap on this L.A. Currents.